Hey there, welcome to the Ryan Kingsline Show. My name's Ryan Kingsline, and in this podcast, we interview amazing artists, creatives, and creators to find out how they tick and how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. Hey there, folks. How's everybody doing? I think I have Daniel here. Yeah, Daniel? Yeah, right here. How are you, my friend? Can you long, hear me? long, long slash super long time. Yeah, it was a long time. I was thinking about when uh, I did a um, tutorial for you. Like I don't know. Um, it's like in the early days. It's like when I was working with Chris yeah. Costa and and back in the URC days. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, and uh, ZBrush was um, what is it? They had that was when the hard surface was really working, and you were pushing hard surface and really doing some amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was yeah panel loops. I think exactly. that was R four or something. Yeah, R four panel loops. Oh yep. man, Good you're stuff. on to other things now, though. Yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> I got my fingers in all of the jars. I mean, I still use ZBrush a lot, but uh, one of the new things is uh, you know Blender that I yeah. uh, work a lot with. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, fun. It's really been uh, picking up, especially with a new development going on for uh, mm-hmm. 2.8. So that's really fun. You know, especially the uh, real-time uh, viewport stuff. That's just amazing to work with. Just getting a you know super fast responsive image. You know, how will the final image look while I'm modeling? You know, no gray mm-hmm. shaded crap. <laughs> that's great. That kind of thing. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to diving in and talking about all that. So. What do you do now? What's the deal? What, what are you up to nowadays? Nowadays, I work at a company uh, called Goodbye Kansas Studios. Mm-hmm. And we have our headquarters in Stockholm, in Sweden. But we also have studios in LA and Germany and London as well. So I've been with them for four years. And I work as uh, head of the modeling department cool. and doing characters and creatures. So look at modeling, sculpting, and grooming, basically. And a tiny bit of coding as well. What kind of coding? Is this just like scripting to get things to work together? Yeah, it's more like uh, simple tools. So for instance, let's say you are uh, sending a project to someone, you're sending project files, Mm -hmm. and perhaps the um, paths to the textures are uh, not relative, basically. So you don't have a a workspace. So it might be like, Oh, C uh, dash, uh, you know, desktop or whatever. Right. And you basically want to quickly relink all those textures. Maya has a path editor, but the thing is, like, currently doesn't work with Udim. So I I wrote one of those just to use Python and, you know, it basically tries to find the file name within a bunch of folders. Fair enough. So it automatically connects the textures for you. So you're doing the modeling, you're doing grooming as well. That's cool. Yeah. Is that a new thing you see coming up, that grooming becoming more significant? Grooming has always been significant. I mean, mm-hmm. looking at games, trying to find you know a great-looking hair has always been challenging. Of course, the, the workflow is different, working in um, pre-rendered or real-time. But you know, working with VFX, it's, I'd almost say it's a bit easier, not as time-consuming, because yeah. uh, you can just groom away and uh, just... Um, it's more procedural than uh, creating hairs for uh, games. Yeah, but you can just we, throw CPUs at it. You just um, throw some cores at it, get some renders going. Just can't <laughs> yeah, do that sure. in games, though. Yeah, exactly. And it's more of a like node-based workflow. Mm-hmm. We work with uh, Yeti for creating the final groom. So basically, the workflow now is that we groom stuff like the simple guides in uh-huh. uh, Blender, and then we convert to Maya Curse and bring them over to... Maya, since we render most of the projects in V-Ray, then we sort of connect these um, curves into the Yeti system. So then you can generate a lot of hairs, basically, based on those that sparse guide sets that mm. you have Ye- from Blender. Yeti is the one where I don't think it's available in the States. Yes, there's some very interesting uh, law stuff going on there. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. I don't know, there's some um, weird stuff that they can only sell it in um, Europe, I think, because there was some kind of copyright thingy. I'm not super uh, informed. The thing that I kind of want to get 
too is a little bit of your career and your career trajectory. You know, mostly just so we have a scope of things because you started out, you've been doing this for a long time, as long as I've been doing this. And um, what was the first thing that you started doing when you got into this industry? I started working for a uh, smaller studio in Stockholm called Milford. And we were doing a lot of uh, like TV commercials in Mm -hmm. that sort of Pixar look, basically, like doing, Mm -hmm. you know, cute characters, that kind of thing. But, you know, I was always interested in doing more realistic work and also ended up doing, (laughs) reluctantly ended up doing rigging for them as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's one of those studios where you kind of have to just make sure that, you know, you take on the work and just make it happen, basically. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, and I was always into um, more real, realistic stuff. So, yeah. you know, during that time, I was beta testing for ZBrush, and I also did some freelancing for Milk VFX in mm-hmm. London, for instance. Yeah, uh, that kind of thing, and always like working on personal projects. That was always one of, one, of, one of the things I loved the most, where you can just do whatever you want and you also have the time to try new workflows and things and applications and try to get the time to learn things because in production there's uh, always you no know, time pressure and a date where you need to deliver stuff as well yeah what's what's been one of the funnest projects you got to work on oh one of the funnest projects that would be um it's definitely stuff that i've been doing at goodbye kansas professionally i'd say like the stuff we did for Conan, or perhaps Overkill's The Walking Dead that we worked on as well. We did a bunch of character trailers for them. I mean, working in a studio is something that I love because, you know, being at the beginning of the pipeline, you get to create stuff and you push it over to the next girl or guy in the line, basically. And they just, you know, sprinkle their magic on top of it and make your own stuff look even better. Like, rigging and uh, animators and all of the rest of the talented artists. Mm. Just amazing to see the final results with your uh, characters in it. What's a day look like, a typical day? like? What time do you get into the office? What time do you leave? Yeah. What do you do while you're there? I'd say my work day starts at the at home, you know, getting the mm-hmm. kids ready for school and stuff like that. And going to work, and it's basically just uh, working on projects also work as like a uh, lead in a lot of the projects that I work on, which mm-hmm. basically means you have a team and you talk to the producers and assign tasks and scheduling and stuff like that. And also do uh, 3D stuff yourself. And then you have people in production coming over and like, oh, we have a bid coming up. Like, what would it take to do, a, you know, a deer or, a, you know, a moose or whatever, that kind of thing. So you're in, mm-hmm. in a bunch of meetings and it's also like daily meetings in the morning. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging to be able to tick everything off at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But So um, lots of meetings? I like meetings when they are productive and most of the meetings are. But, you know, there's always the case where you end up and you sort of stray away from the essence of the meeting that you were supposed to, you know, uh, the, the stuff that you were supposed to talk about. Like, oh, you end up talking about some issue with a pipeline or whatever. Yeah. So I think that it's important to, uh, yeah, stay on target in meetings. Right. So talk to me about this piece, Adam. This was such a cool project to come out. Yeah, that was a tech demo for Unity, mm-hmm. I guess. Of, what is this, two years ago or something? Yeah. And so I created two characters, Sebastian and Lou, and they were based off the uh, like the base model that Plamen uh, Tavnev uh, made. So I modeled those a lot of ZBrush, a lot of uh, Marvelous Designer, and Blender as well. How many polys was each character? Because they look oh. awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. Oh, I. Jesus Christ, I don't really remember. Could it be like the game resolution might be, could it be around 200 or 250,000 triangles, perhaps? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, uh, yeah, I think these are actually downloadable somewhere on mm-hmm. Unit's uh, website or so. So everyone, anyone could uh, download them. That's great. And your job was to create the, um, well, the high resolution mesh. The high, 
yeah. Yeah, the okay. high resolution mesh and then also the low resolution mesh. And at the end, you know, it came sort of tight towards the deadline because of some changes. So I got some help from a couple of other amazing artists at the office, uh, mm-hmm. Sandra and Christopher uh, Brandstrom. Okay. All right. And um, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot when we are uh, talking just tech, and I just want to talk for tech for a second, and then I kind of want to, there's a couple of things um, Susan mentioned you can uh, chat about, I think in terms of Blender. So I kind of want to jump into that. But um, one of the things that comes up, because you're, I would consider you a, you know, this is might be a little weird phrasing, but I'd consider you a consummate character artist. Like you can get in there and just make shit happen and go from beginning all the way to the end. So either games or film, like I'm not, I'm not distinguishing between any of it. It's just you finish pieces, right? And you always have, but it, one of the big issues that I think people have starting out and people who have been in, in, in the industry for a while and just artists in general is number one, finishing things. And yep. then along the lines of doing that, what I'd love to know or see if we can unpack a little bit is just how you think about the construction of these things so that you are able to finish so many pieces. And what is in my mind along this is a lot of times people get stuck on polygon count or topology or let's say, for example, these pieces of fabric. Do I create them separately? Do I create them all as one piece of geometry? You know, how do I make these things efficient and so that they fit within the game? You know, all these kind of production concerns come in. So how do you or or what is your mindset when you're going about creating work that lets you produce so dang much? I think it's kind of interesting. I think I have quite a different approach than a lot of other artists because I see a lot of artists that are very, what do you say, systematic in their um, workflow. So, you know, mm-hmm. they go for, okay, now I'm doing the just the base mesh. Now I'm going to sculpting. Now I'm done with sculpting. And I go into, uh, you know, okay, creating the correct topology, creating UVs, you know, that very mm-hmm. standard sort of way of working. But I'm very much, if I create something, either if it's for work or personal stuff, I just bash it out as fast as I can. Just junk geometry and a lot of sear measure. Mm -hmm. um, And then just auto UV everything. And then sort of go into a substance painter as soon as possible and then render it. So... I don't really care about high resolution sculpting at that first point. It's very messy because of nowadays a lot of the fine details I can do much faster just by doing procedural texturing in Substance Designer, for instance. Right. So then if I do that first round, just doing the character from start to finish, I see where it's lacking and I get the final image as soon as possible. And then I can go back like, okay, this took me X amount of days or whatever. And then I'm like, okay, so this gives me a good idea of what was hard and where I might get stuck. And now I sort of, you know, I have something that is finished. It doesn't look as good as it could be, but Mm -hmm. all the elements are there. And now I just have to go back and, and fix those. And on the plus side, that gives me, if I'm working towards a deadline, that gives me some, you know, peace of mind that, you know, everything is in place and now I just have to make it look better. And since I'm working in Substance Designer, and if I do, I try to, in Substance Painter as well, I try to be as, you know, not hand painting at all, if I can. Mm. Just doing everything procedural and try yeah. using triplanar mapping, stuff like that. Because then it's just like, yeah, I just replace the mesh and, you know, it's all there even replace the UVs or whatever, and the texture is still there. So that's really important to me. And also, like, as you mentioned, how would you go about like finishing pieces? And that is, I'd say, the best way is try to set a very, you know, a small scope. We all hear this source about people that's like, oh, I'm going to create uh, wolves running through a forest. And then it's going to be like, you know, it just expands uh, and you're never going to be able to finish it. On your yeah. Own. Yeah. I mean, if I was to summarize, I'd say definitely keep your scope, your project scope. Yeah. And then one of the issues we have with project scope is feature creep, right? Like basically Windows 7, just feature after feature after mm-hmm. feature keeps getting added to it. And yes. so that that becomes a problem. But 
it sounds to me like momentum and forward progress to getting this thing into substance, like that's your first sprint. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of sprints, but if we were to use development terms, like that's the big sprint yeah. to get it into substance. And then you can go back and make things and optimize things and, and whatnot. But you're trying to get it into substance painter and designer as quickly as possible. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. How, how does ZBrush fit into this? You know, because, you know, I helped develop the program a long, 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 like a long, long time ago. And I've been looking at this and I'm like, man, the ZBrush is like the king and I love the program. But the only competition I see for that program right now, and it's actually strong competition, is a logarithmic. You know, like I, I look at environment arts, a lot of the stuff we used to do in ZBrush is a logarithmic in terms of skin. You know, I still do all my skin in ZBrush because it's for me, it's awesome. But I'm seeing people are like, no, now we just do it in Mari. You know, they just use texturing.xyz and go right there. So how does ZBrush fit into this? Is it coming in as like a part of your modeling, which I think I've seen some people doing, or are you still doing a ton of sculpting or do you use it as a hub app or how does it fit into it now? It's definitely the first application that I go into to yeah. start blocking out the characters. So it's more like if I'm doing uh, very mechanical hard surface stuff, I yeah. might do that in Blender and then I do the organic stuff and sculpting in ZBrush and try to collect and um, put everything together in <laughs> both applications at the same time. Almost. But ZBrush is great. And one of the the best things I like about it is that you can just sculpt away and then you can go back to like the lowest subdivision and you, what's it called? It's, I think it's called freeze subdivision. And then you can basically replace the geometry. Yeah. And then it, um, when you're done, it projects the new mesh on top of the, uh, based on the other higher subdivisions. Totally. Yeah. You could just go yeah. to the lowest, import a brand new set of geometry that you got out of Blender or something like that, or even in ZBrush, and then it just swap it out. Oh, yeah, definitely. So it's, yeah. it's a strong hub application for you, in essence. Like, that's your yeah, uh, home things plug into that. Yeah, and also that I don't have to worry about topology at all uh, mm -hmm. in the early stages, because that's basically my workflow, just doing sculpting, pushing and pulling, and then go back to the lowest subdivision, freeze subdivision, and zero mesh, and then press freeze subdivision levels again, and everything yeah. higher is uh, reprojected, basically. Okay, cool. That makes sense. That's a lot of what I've actually been seeing, is, especially with the Z remesh, the decimate, and the projection. Those compounded with the sculpting tools, that's really just been what allows ZBrush to maintain such a, a warm part in our hearts, you know, because what well, Blender's got sculpting, but it's, you know, it's not ZBrush sculpting, right? No, it is not, but it is uh, very good, actually. And uh, the thing I love about it is that when it comes to sculpting environments, you mm -hmm. have, you know, a camera where you can... You can be inside of the environment. You can mm -hmm. actually like move around as you would in a game, that kind of thing. Well, before we get in and we start looking at some of that stuff in Blender, what do you think is, because you've been a character artist for a while, so you've seen people come and go, what do you think is necessary for somebody to have a skill or something in their portfolio to really show that they're a job candidate? I ask this of everybody, and you know, I just, I want to know, like, what can help somebody who's listening to this and they're like, you know, I want to learn from Daniel. Daniel's guy, like how long you've been in this industry over a decade. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think they need to do today? Cause a lot's changed. Like PBR changed a lot. The software's changed. Substance changed everybody. What do they need today yeah. to really qualify to come underneath you and work with you as a character artist? I guess it depends on different studios and wh yeah. what type of studio you want to work for. Mm -hmm. But I'd say the most important thing is to show, you know, as you mentioned, finished pieces where it is like, yeah, this is the final product. And you can do a breakdown where you show off the different stages, like you have the base model and you have the sculpt and you have perhaps breakdown of the different textures mm -hmm. and where uh, the, uh, you know, the people that's going to hire you or uh, looking for talent is able to see your UV layout that kind of thing, if you're mm -hmm. a student. I wouldn't say that, uh, you know, looking at my portfolio, that is a good reference mm -hmm. for um, uh, getting work because I don't, I'm not 
very uh, good at doing all that sort of breakdown. But mm-hmm. I'm already employed, so I don't really have to <laughs> worry about that <laughs> right now. So finished pieces, that's really important, I'd say. Sometimes I get questions about this and people are very much into, I, I would just like to sculpt, you know, I just want to sculpt. And mm-hmm. I mean, Goodbye Kansas Studios in Stockholm is a, it's a mid-sized studio. So if we bring on a character artist, we want that person to do a bunch of stuff. Modeling, sculpting, and texturing, is that's really essential and setting up a simple look dev. But we also want character artists to know how to groom and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. you know, knowing all of these different skills of the trade is quite challenging, but we offer a lot of support and try to teach all the artists. So that's something that I think we excel in helping each other. If you are applying for a game studio, that's a bigger game studio, it's probably going to be more specific skill set mm-hmm. like for instance doing just characters or just environment art whereas in at goodbye kansas you might uh, get to do both that kind of thing Got it. it kind of depends on the projects that land and uh, yeah so and you yeah. said when you first started this conversation you described yourself as a modeler not necessarily a character artist but like a modeler Is no i would say no nah, i mean i'm I think I said I was uh, working as head of modeling, uh, mm-hmm. which means managing the modeling team. Yeah. But I am a, a character creature artist at, at heart, and that's what I do, basically. But the team that somebody might apply for is not necessarily a character art team. It's it's modeling. In the mid-sized studio, you got to be able to be rounded enough to model a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. We basically want other persons in the team to be able to tackle a bunch of different subjects like uh, hard surface or organic, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. What's one of the biggest mistakes you've made <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> on a, a really job? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> or in your art, but, you know, I'm just thinking in your career, not your personal life. You know, we'll, we'll save that for a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, biggest mistake. That's, that's a really inter- interesting one. I mean, I make mistakes all the time. I think I might have, I, I'd say like um, um, saying, agreeing to do stuff that I didn't really was passionate about. Mm. So for instance, I mentioned earlier a company that I worked for that, that I um, said yes to doing rigging and, you know, yeah. I'd learned to do that in school, but I, you know, my heart wasn't really into it. And yeah, so I would, sometimes that can be a door opener. I guess, and, you know, open up for other possibilities in the future, you know, getting the foot in the door and that kind of thing. But for me, it was like, I wish I would had perhaps said no and and, uh, tried to apply for different jobs earlier in my Mm -hmm. career. But then again, like nowadays, I'm I'm really happy that I did it because now I can speak rigging uh, with a rigging artist and, and understand what is necessary for producing a good rig and you know, deformation, that kind of thing. What about on a project? You know, Because what I'm trying to understand and, and also communicate, because a lot of times people don't realize the things that go wrong and you know, the mistakes that they make in the beginning you know, and all kinds of stuff arises as artists. You know, do we, like I was working um, on Green Lantern and I was in the concept department uh, it was very short time period I was doing this and uh, I was working for a costumer and a costumer had no idea. She had, she had like an Oscar. She had no idea how to work with 3d. So she'd like, I want dolphin skin. And, but I want it done in 3d and I, you know, and I want it done in an hour and it's like, it takes an hour to open Maya. Right. So how am I going to work all this? And then it was just back and forth. It was absolute nightmare. And I ended up getting fired basically after a mm. week and a half. You know, and all of it came about because I was trying to appease this person, whereas I wasn't just saying, no, this is not possible. It's, no, you can't do this. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Did you ever not deliver on a project? No, I haven't experienced that. I Always deliver. That's awesome. Uh, well, it, you just have to um, be, I, as I mentioned earlier, just be yeah. realistic about what you can achieve in a certain time and, and sort of communicate that 
to your uh, closest boss, basically. That's a good point. So, I do think communication is such an important part of this because there's so many moving parts, which I think is the other thing that's very fascinating about your work is you go back and forth between software a lot. Yeah, that's, um, you know, it's basically picking the cherry from each application and trying to use the stuff that it's really good at, like, you know, mm-hmm. Marvelous for uh, clothes and and Blender for, uh, you know, visualizing and uh, hard surface stuff. Yeah. And uh, ZBrush for sculpting, basically. Well, I would say now would be a good time if you want, Susan said you had something in Blender you could show us to help us understand this. And um, anything I can do to promote that, because what they're doing is amazing, like blows my mind. They're, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I used to tell people two years ago that software sophistication was a part of what made you a job candidate. So you needed to do Maya or Max. And I don't know about you, but I think those days are gone. I think that Blender really opens up for a new um, paths. I guess mm-hmm. it's it's always different. I think that you know whenever you come in touch with a pipeline, there's probably going to be a, an application like Maya, for instance, where you yeah. need to publish your stuff. But modeling, it's such a you know that can be done done anywhere. Yeah. And Blender is such a no brainer because there's no you don't need to buy it basically. You just need to support it any way you can. <laughs> every yeah. way, like they uh, take donations and stuff like that. Well, you want to so, you want to share your screen and, and walk us through something? Oh yeah, sorry. I'm um, getting ahead of myself. Let's I see will here. make you presenter. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, let's do this. I think I yeah I had the tiger here. Can you see Yay! my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was okay. hoping you were going to show this one. I didn't. I didn't want to. Get anybody's hopes up. This is grooming. You're actually showing you've you've groomed this inside of Blender, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is Blender 2.8. So it's not stable yet. It's still in development, but it's uh, it they do nice builds, so it's available for anyone. Mm. And what we're looking at is the real time uh, viewport named uh, Eevee, like the Pokemon. It's insane, like. Uh, all the fur here, like being able to go to like, and it's even having, uh, you know, shadows casted by the fur itself. So that's really nice. That's one of the cases when uh, sort of you um, do grooms in any application. That you, It's really hard to get a, a decent preview of what it's going to look like in the end. So having this in real time is a huge time saver. Even though I might not be rendering in in Blender, mm-hmm. I can still do grooms and get the curves out to whatever other application I'm I'm rendering in. And also, like all the the nice thing about texturing here, you know, like uh, Substance or Mari, they have sort of an export workflow where mm-hmm. you you are working internally in that application, and when you want to get the textures out, you have to press export basically and right. wait, and you know they export. But in Blender, you can have textures that lives on your drive, basically. So then I can paint texture maps, both color or you know density maps, within mm-hmm. Blender, and then it updates in real time in the other application where I'm going to be uh, rendering in. So it's this. referencing files, kind of like Marmoset might or whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's not built so in or saved the, within yeah. it. So. We got a question here. Yours asking, what kind of PC, you know, or I guess what kind of PC are you running this on? What do you, what do you think are the requirements for somebody to run? Because that's a crazy amount of fur. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it is. I'm running a GTX 1080, but I actually had, I don't know, I, I bought my new computer, I guess, a year ago. And before that, I was running like GTX 600 series something which is a really old graphics card and it's really shitty. And Mm -hmm. uh, I actually had uh, issues with certain things in Eevee that uh, didn't work because it was such an old card. But I could still do a lot of stuff, like uh, 95% of the features were there and and it worked and everything was running really smooth. Because that's, I guess, that's one of the questions I get on ArtStation or, or YouTube, stuff like that, that people sort of expect it to be a, you know, a monster computer that, that runs yeah. this in real time. But it's, yeah. it's really not. 
which is, uh, yeah, it's a cool thing. All right. So explain to me a bit of this. Now, just assume I'm, because I am a total noob when it comes to Blender. And I um, I spent so much time in ZBrush, you know, I, I almost forgot my yeah. Maya roots, you know, it's like, so what are we looking at now? Is this viewport? Is this Eevee? And what is Eevee? Help me understand just what I'm looking at in terms of the viewport and in terms of the render, if I'm in some special mode or not. Ah, right. So basically, you have these... I wonder if I can paint on the screen. Yeah, I saw they have that. Um, can you see if I'm painting now? Uh, uh, perhaps I can. Okay, so basically up, um, up here... Yep, I see it now. Yeah. There's a couple of buttons, and uh, <laughs> basically this is the uh, this shows just the wireframe. Yeah, I guess we have some fur clipping here, and this one would be sort of the uh, it's called the solid mode. So this is what you would be uh, pretty used to in any applications. Okay. Uh, you have been working in earlier, like, uh, you know, that standard boring gray viewport, basically, where sure. you just model. And then the next one is very much like a uh, substance painter, where you have a look dev mode. So it has these, a couple of HDRIs, which uh, ships with Blender. Mm -hmm. You just can rotate this around. And uh, it's not ray traced, so the environment sphere, the HDRI, doesn't cast any shadows, so it's it's only uh, screen space ambient occlusion, and okay. any shadows would be uh, needed to be cast by uh, lights. And then at the final stage, you have the final EV viewport. And the nice thing is that you can, once you're here, you can switch your render engine to uh, Cycles, which is the uh, Blender's uh, path tracer. So we'll see. So then it needs to... This is usually pretty fast, but there's a lot of... Yeah, they haven't fixed the intensity of the lights yet. Well, I'm oh, familiar with weird. that problem with Maya, so that's not uncommon. <laughs> All right, yeah. so you're in EV right now, then you switch over to Cycles. Cycle, what's the advantage of Cycles? So Cycles is the path tracer, basically. So I, I think I could show in, if mm -hmm. I just create a new scene, perhaps it would be uh, a bit clearer. So let's just make something. I just have this stuff. So here's where you can just set material. Yeah, just something fast here. Kind of like that. And uh, here is basically where I set my yeah. So this is Eevee still, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna create an environment sphere and just hook up some HDRI. This is also nice, just being able to see the actual textures. So there we go. I have something like that. Another fun thing is that it's really easy to connect materials as well. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if I have this and just, yeah, you know what? Use this material for it as well, which is very nice. So let's see, roughness. Yeah, something low there. Yeah, so now we're in Eevee, and we have set up a very simple scene. And if I switch to, this is still in OpenGL. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, all the normal stuff like, Subsurface scattering, uh, screen space reflections, what you get there. Ambient occlusion. Let's just crank that up so we can see it a bit more. Yeah, yeah this is really exaggerated. And if you switch to cycles, you get the path tracer. So it's, um, yeah, 
It's just uh, rendering as you would do in Mantra or uh, Arnold or something like that. One mm -hmm. thing is like you can, uh, since it's very much integrated in Blender, I can like do modeling and stuff when I'm still rendering. One of those problems you usually have in other applications where you have to translate your scene all the time. So you might do in other applications, okay, I change the material or I change a certain um, mm -hmm. thing in the materials, perhaps mm -hmm. change the displacement, and then you need to restart the render, basically. But right. here it just uh, works. So it's very, it's nice in terms of, you know, just doing stuff fast and and being fluent in in your in your workflow basically yeah, so it's almost like if keyshot was built into zbrush basically yeah yeah and then so it, arnold these guys are offline renderers so i mean they have a live mode in the camera but it this looks infinitely cleaner all right so i understand that and by path you mean basically ray tracing right that's another way to say it yes okay Great. That so then cool. um, if we go back to the fur, yep. I, I don't know how much I can ask for, but I would love to understand <laughs> okay. because you said grooming is, you know, it's it's one of these things that's important to your job. How does yep. somebody begin even just thinking about developing this? Because I'd assume, you know, if, if I know anything about fur, like it's not it's not just like an hour job, not a day job. It's like it takes a while, right? Yeah. How long does it take um, just overall so people have a sense of expectation? Because you know artists are always asking, how long does it take? Oh, oh, uh, the tiger? Yeah, the fur mostly, the um, grooming. Oh, uh, the grooming. I'd say, what could I spend on that? Perhaps, um, I don't know, three three work days, I'd say. Uh, uh, what? Something like that. Yeah, but that that's the thing. Mind. Yeah, it, it, that's the thing with <laughs> getting... Being able to see it, such a good feedback is then <sighs> you can make informed decisions very fast. Mm, but if you're yes. like, if you need to render and wait for the render and and, and being able to see uh, your final look of the fur, it takes much longer because you mm. have to wait for rendering and you sort of you also lose track of what you were doing. But if you can see what you're doing, everything is so much easier. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. So how does somebody even begin to get in the process, start to learn this, start to do this? What's the steps? There is a bunch of tutorials for Blender, and they uh, the Blender Foundation also ha have a um, web page with tutorials, which I think you can, uh, you can pay to get access to those tutorials. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of tutorials online as well. The only tricky thing is like, you know, uh, Blender 2.8 is the with the delicious viewport and everything. That's that's the stuff you want to get into as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But all of the tutorials are made for the old version of Blender, mm -hmm. where you know certain things are in different places in the user interface. So it can be tricky to learn 2.8 since you have to look at old tutorials basically. But the like the foundation, all the, all the, like the, how you do a groom, for instance, uh, that's the same thing. It's the only difference is setting it up for Eevee with shading and things like that. Mm -hmm. And also, like uh, a, a tricky thing with Bender is that since it's free, there is a lot of tutorials, and not every one of those tutorials are. All uh, you know is made by a professional person, so you, mm. you will you will have to dig through a lot of um, uh, tutorials that much. Well, help me understand some of the uh, just the conceptual framework for grooming. When it starts out, we don't need to get into the demo side of it, but just when it's when it starts out, what's the first thing you're thinking about? Is it paths that just describe a general direction? You know, and this is short hair to some extent. So, what's the very first thing that you start to think about? Well, um, the first thing I start to think about is uh, looking at a reference and try to figure out how the initial, uh, like the, the flow of the fur mm -hmm. would be. Yeah, I get so, um, and then, you know, uh, a good way of working is to start trying to 
just finding out for yourself, sort of almost painting out, uh, lipstick painting out the direction of the fur based on the reference. And then you just uh, groom it uh, like so. Okay, so directionality is the first thing. Then yeah. what are some of the important stages that you have to go through? So for example, if we're doing, I'll give you a ZBrush example. If you're using something like fiber mesh, you know, it's super easy for that to go south. <laughs> that program yeah that part of it uh, needs more development but um one of the first things that we do is we establish the poly groups so that you are able to group things separately then the next thing we do is we start to establish the direction of each kind of clump and then once we've got each clump with its specific direction and, and directionality then the next thing that you do is you start to kind of build the bridge between the clumps, you start to kind of move them around. So one of the key things that I use in fiber mesh is groom twist. And I learned that from Hossein Deba. And it's like, that, that's the, it's the secret brush. And um, is there anything like that when we're dealing with grooming inside of Blender here, where we've got to be, this is the thing that really can help separate crap from awesome. Yeah. Let's see if I can do a quick thing on a model or something here, just to show off the basic stage. Let's see here. Let's just delete some of these things. Yeah. So uh, if we start this uh, guy over here, so you have to go down here to the particle settings, and then mm -hmm. you create a new uh, particle set. And uh, you can e either choose it to be an emitter or a hair, basically. Got it. So, yeah. So let's see here. So this would be uh, the number of hairs here. But I usually just go in and uh, add them by hand. So you can add this and Doing a real life. I apologize. I wasn't uh, prepared uh, prepared to show this off. Then I would have a question. Oh. My bad. My bad. I just this is. I mean, you've done such an amazing job that anything that you can do to help us is going to go a long way. Because I know my students are going to be looking at this like the Holy Grail right there. Hmm. Yeah, so um, down here, like this is the particle settings, and um, what I, um, the different modes here is yep. so when you press tab, you can go into particle edit. Yep. And on some grooming, I'm just going to do a, sorry, just a, really fresh scene so I don't have old stuff. Sure. Perfect. So, yeah. Okay, got your model going yes. down to your particles, yeah. create a particle. Exactly. And emitter, and emitter so, turn it into hair. Whoa. Yeah. Here we go. So, uh, like from the start, it's you can see here that all the curves are in screen space. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter if I if I go out, they look thick, and if I go in, they look uh, thin. Okay. So you have to go into the render settings and then go to let's see, hair, 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 hair. Where are you? There we go, and change it to strip. And then you get something that is actually in, you know, have a thickness in world space. Mm -hmm. All right. And then go here. So this is particle settings. And this is basically your sparse um, guide set. So this, these are actual 
curves that you can groom. Okay. And like if I do something like this, just get this. And then if you uh, want to have more resolution, just going to down to the viewport display here. Mm -hmm. And so you can, like, even if I go down to like two, it's very, you know, it's not a many spans, but if yeah. I go to, uh, th these are the actual particle curves. Yeah. So, if I go up here, and then I can change from, now it's like, uh, there's no interpolated curves, so each of these strands are an actual groom curve. But then I can go into like simple, and then you would have from each strand paint like that sorry from each strand it would be like a circle and then it would be uh generating and yeah. uh, other strands on top of that like like guide so, curves in x gen exactly yeah so and uh then you go into interpolated and then it just uh, interpolated uh, a lot of curves in between so mm -hmm. if you have a curve like that, a curve like that, and a curve like that, it creates nice. interpolated curves in between mm -hmm. instead of having this clump kind of thing. And then uh, further down, you have clumping, things like that. And again, I'm going to turn on ambient occlusion here, which is really nice. So we can see a bit better. And um, one of the nice things, like um, in other applications, you uh, you sort of need to keep the amount of spans all the time, uh, mm -hmm. so it's equal for all the curves, which is really, you know, it's kind of a waste of uh, space if you're doing, you know, short hair and then you have long hair. You don't need 10 spans on these short hairs and then have 10 spans on the long hair. In here, you can just go in, choose a bunch of curves like this, mm -hmm. and then you can set a new resolution for those. So here we see. Let's see. Yeah. I don't know if you can see all the. Um, A little bit, yeah. Point. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I can increase it perhaps. So now we have a. This uh, curve right here has a bunch of um, spans. This and one. the other one is a little harder to see. Yeah, there we go. I can see it now. Okay. Yeah. So that kind of thing. So that's uh, uh, a big thing. That's really nice that you are able to um, have different uh, spans on different curves. Mm -hmm. You can have multiple hair systems as well on the same, uh, same geometry. Well, that gives and us a another, bit of a primer, but yeah, go for it. Yeah. And um, another thing I like is like here, um, you have a bunch of buttons over here. And the left one, you just have the curves. Yeah. And if you press this one, you see all of the different points of the curves. And you can actually just grab one of those and start moving it like this. So you get a really good uh, uh, fly away. control uh, but yeah, of each strand, which is nice. And you can also you know, select a bunch of hairs like that, and you can just groom it up. Um, I see so it. That's really nice. And so my workflow is usually that I have a general hair shape, mm -hmm. maybe like so. Yeah. And the usual, 
problem you have in CG is that your hair looks very. Uh, everything is groomed in the same way, and don't you don't have a nice breakup or overlap. Right. Then you can go in here and you can select, let's see, random like that, and then you can just, uh, whoops. Select random, and you can select how many percent of these curves uh -huh, that you want. Uh -huh. So then you can create that nice uh, breakup and overlap ah, that you are looking for. This yeah. is the, this is this like place. in ZBrush we use polygroups for this, but this is twenty thousand times easier or uh, more efficient, I think. Yeah, exactly. I mean, love uh, grooming in ZBrush too, but this is sure. um, yeah. It, it, there's um, some benefits uh, working here. And also, like, all well, the interface is so easy to just uh, assign a shortcut, for instance. So I'll mm -hmm. just set Alt-R here, for instance. So that means I can very easily access that function. Mm -hmm. Nice. So that's cool. And then you have a bunch of, like, um, let's see, you have... Uh, so you have roughness just to break so up procedural. strands. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So These are like uh, modifiers. One of the, one, yeah, exactly. And one of the drawbacks with the current hair system in Blender is that you have a set amount of modifiers. Mm -hmm. Whereas, like uh, in Yeti, we uh, that we use in production, so we just have a node network where we create the the inputs of the geometry and the groom curves, and then we can like add you know, five uh, frisk nodes after one another and just um, do whatever, basically. But this is, um, the, the settings in Blender is that you have, you have one slider for clumping, for instance. Mm -hmm. And if you, ha you want to have different looks of hair on different areas, you need to create different hair systems. Then of course you also have the ability to, you know, I can like I can weight paint a certain area, mm -hmm. and or texture it if I want to use it in another application. So I can say that okay, there was a vertex group created here, and I just mm -hmm. call that um, clumping, for instance. Then down here to the vertex groups, and I just Take like the clumping there, and if I so you see here now when I mm -hmm. drag the slider, the only area that is affected is this thing that I painted earlier. Okay, got it. And yeah, so that's cool. And you can also have almost uh, Houdini-like uh, things where you have perhaps uh, you know have a cube that moves through this object, and you. This cube can emit a weight and affect the hair, things okay. like that. So that's nice. And you say you can have multiple hair systems, and are, are you basically just saying different emitters? I can show you. So, for instance, on the tiger, I, mm -hmm. I broke it up. So I had one system. Head, uh, one system of the body, and things mm -hmm. like that. So it was very easy for me to. Add extra density on the head, for instance. Right. So if I create another one, set it to hair, just set that to zero, and um, if I just add a couple of hairs over here, I can Let's see here. When I'm grooming, I can uh, choose which particle system I'm I'm working with. Mm -hmm. so, totally. So that's uh, really nice if you are having a complex hair where uh, you know you just want to the right side of the hair and mm -hmm. and you want to have or the the left side. You know, like if somebody's got a the left side of their head shaved and the hair big mop of hair goes yeah. off to the right, 
two different systems. Exactly. Yes. Daniel, this is great. I don't want to ask for anything more because I think you've you've definitely done gone above and beyond. And I really appreciate sharing that that process and showing us the work. Thank you. Sure thing. All right. All right, guys. Any questions you guys got for Daniel? Shout them out right now because we got a short time window. Joseph is asking, what's the list of Blender add-ons you recommend? That's a great question, Joseph, because there's so many. Yeah. God. Yeah, definitely. I would say Box Cutter is a great add-on. It's created by a um, guy who guys, uh, goes by the uh, nickname Master C, I think, and also created this other add-on, Hard Ops, which is all, uh, also very nice. So both of those are very much hard surface modeling uh, mm-hmm. add-ons. I use uh, Retopo Flow for uh, uh, retopping. That is only, and that's something to be aware of, that a lot of these applications are only usable for 2.79 since they are, in the new version, they are still changing the API. So mm-hmm. that means that, you know, add-ons that use a certain Functions might be, uh, you know, lose their functionality when uh, the Blender developers uh, change the API. So, but but uh, Master Sion and the box cutter team are really good at, you know, keeping track of that and and um, adding new versions all the time. So that's nice. Awesome. Tony's asking uh, particle systems default. I assume that's the default particle hair system, correct? No add-on. Yes, that is correct. Daniel. If you're going for character work, how important is it to show prop work as well? It's a great question, Daniel. And the, the question is, in the portfolio, do I just need to put characters or do I need to prop, do prop work? And he's probably asking because I made him make a prop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I think that sometimes if I'm looking for character artists, yeah, I would definitely just look at the after characters in people's mm-hmm. re- uh, reels or in their galleries. But sometimes we take on people who do props and then they have a passion for doing characters and they start learning characters and you mm-hmm. sort of have that. So yeah, a prop can serve that pur- purpose, sort of gets you in the door for character work, I guess. But I would never require to see a, a prop from a character artist. Awesome. All right, yeah. guys, that's about all the time we have. Daniel, man, great to... Um... Great to talk. I mean, we really never even talked uh, extensively back at the URC day. So it's great to talk and get to learn a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and see the It was work. nice talking to you. Yeah. All right, guys, you can see the screen, artstation.com forward slash D Bystead. And uh, head over there and follow Daniel over there and uh, like all the work. And uh, Daniel, again, thank you so much, my friend. Yeah, no problem. Bye-bye. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe you haven't learned a bunch. But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right. Thank you so much again for being here. Take care. Have an amazing day.